Hello, everyone. I'm Suzanne Basala, President and CEO of the US Japan Council. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our webinar, Nature Based Solutions for Addressing Climate Change An Outlook for Japan and the Asia Pacific. And this is part of our Climate and Sustainability Initiative. Before we get going, I want to point out that our program is available in both English and Japanese. Our speakers will present in both languages, so please choose the correct language setting on the globe icon to hear the interpretation if needed. And instructions are on the screen, and I just want to take a moment to thank our interpreters for their hard work. Please use the chat today. Tell us who you are, share your perspective. We really use these conversations in chat to help us develop further program ideas. And if you wanna send questions for our panel to consider, use the Q&A tab, not chat. And that's how the moderator will see your message. Okay, so we are honored today to host a diverse, expert and high level set of speakers. And I know you're eager to hear from them, but first please allow me a word about the US Japan Council. We're an educational nonprofit founded by Japanese Americans and active throughout the United States and Japan, cultivating and connecting leaders to strengthen this precious US Japan relationship. Our members represent diverse professions, sectors, generations, and perspectives. We share a commitment to people to people ties and build a better future for our communities, our nations, and the world that depends on a strong US-Japan partnership. None of this could be possible without our members and our sponsors. And today we especially recognize the founding strategic partner of our climate and sustainability initiative, Amazon, who provides not only generous financial support, but has been a thought partner and active participant. I'd also like to thank our other platinum sponsors, American Airlines, Fabit and Toyota. The next, next I would like to thank our title sponsors, the Aritani Foundation, Central Pacific Bank, Daikin, Deloitte, EY, Hitachi, Ito N, MUFG, NEC, NTT, Oryx, PXP, Terasaki Nibe Foundation, and the Toshizo Watanabe Foundation. It's an incredible group. Um, while we're also, we are also supported by several companies and individuals, and hopefully you saw this list of sponsors while you're in the waiting room, um, but I'm going to scroll through it here again because they truly do deserve recognition. We're fortunate to have the support of so many terrific companies and people and are humbled by what this says about the importance so many others place on people to people connections, the alliance investing in the next generation and partnering to reach our climate ambitions. So thank you to all the sponsors for your generous support to the council and to our mission. And I'm just gonna pause here because I know, okay. And then lastly, I would like to thank Pictor for their collaboration on today's webinar. Uh, to set the scene for our dialogue, we've on we're honored to welcome Yuki Isogai. She is the lead partner at PwC Japan's Sustainability Center of Excellence. So perfect choice for us to moderate today. Uh, she has been involved in private sector development in Eastern Europe, Asia, and Africa, promoting investment by Japanese companies in private companies and government organizations. So Yuki, thank you so much for being with us today. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you for the introduction. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Yuki Isogai. As introduced by Suzanne, I'm lead partner on, of sustainability practice here in Japan. I'm really excited to facilitate this uh, session on nature-based solutions for addressing climate change. Um, I would like to show my sincere appreciation to the US-Japan Council to host such an interesting seminar. So let me introduce the distinguished panelists today. So we have three panelists today. Alison Lewin, Director of Climate Change Partnership in APEC, the Nature Conservancy. Ken Hai, Head of Energy and Environmental Policy at APEC at Amazon Web Services. Hiroetsu Aoyama, Director of Environment Policy Office at Ocean and Environmental Policy Division of Ports and Harbors Bureau at the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism of Japan. So thank you very much for joining us today. 
And before st starting the panel discussions, I would like to give you a brief overview what the nature-based nature, nature -based solution is. So, next page, please. Um, so nature 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 based solution is very wide concept. Um, it's the the presentation says a lot, but you know I just wanted to share with you that it is expected to contribute to climate change measures, both mitigation and adaptation, and biodiversity conservation. The concept has been changing, but the most important thing is what I just said. Next page, please. But you know, because this is a new concept, I think there are many common misunderstanding of the concept. The first misunderstanding is that nature-based solution is completely new concept, but it is not. You know, nature-based solution is a concept that lies in ecosystem approach and ecosystem approach has been developed over the last few decades. So certain amount of knowledge, wisdom have been already accumulated. And second misunderstanding is that the NBS is to abandon the modern approaches um, and you know uh, revive the very ancient approaches. But again, this is not the truth. Um, Nature-based solution is to optimize the capacity of nature in a manner that suits the modern era. And third misunderstanding is that nature-based solution contradicts modern technological approaches. But again, this is on the contrary, um, nature-based solution and modern technology can be complementary to each other. So next page, please. So here you can, so next page, please, sorry. And here you can see examples of nature-based solutions. And I do not want to go into details because of time constraint, but you know, based on these, based on the findings of these, these, these examples and pilot projects, um, it is reported that nature-based solutions can provide about 30% of cost-effective mitigation measures for decarbonization. And next page, please. Also, you know, this example shows that ecosystem-based disaster risk, re re disaster risk re reduction is also one of the very key elements of nature-based solutions. And I stop here today, and I am sure that the panelists have much wider and richer knowledge and experiences. So I would like to open the discussions now. Um, after this presentation, I would like to firstly ask to each panelist what their organization are doing in which kind of areas. So firstly, I would like to invite Alison Lewin. So I understand that the Nature Conservancy is very active in this area. So we would like to hear from her what are the nature-based solutions and what are the potential benefits. Also, she is focusing on APEC. So we would like to hear from her a bit of APEC perspective nuances um, of the activities. And my personal interest is also, you know, Carbon offset growth is, well, it is a little bit in discussion that carbon offset growth and actual emission decarbonization, how can we make balance between these two? So, Alison, I would like to hear from you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Yuki, and, and thank you to the U.S.-Japan Council as well for inviting the Nature Conservancy to be part of this event. Um, for those who don't know us, the Nature Conservancy, or TNC, is a global environmental NGO with a mission to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. We work in more than 70 countries and territories worldwide with more than 4,000 staff, 400 scientists on staff, and we really focus on employing a science-based approach, um, a collaborative approach, 
to achieving our goals that's really focused on, on finding solutions. Um, at TNC, I lead a regional team in Asia Pacific that's focused on advancing nature-based solutions as an essential part of the global and regional response to climate change. Um, so very happy to be here speaking with everyone about this today. Next slide, please. I always think um, whenever I'm talking about nature-based solutions, I always think it's important to, to um, put these conversations in the context of the urgency that we're dealing with. Um, I know for me, it can sometimes be a bit daunting and overwhelming um, to just understand what's needed and, and how far we still have to go, frankly. But at the same time, I think it can also be empowering to recognize the urgency and, and use that as a starting point to really act on what the science is telling us. Next slide, please. So we just heard a little bit from Yuki about, about nature-based solutions, which, which can be quite a broad concept. And what I will focus in a little bit more on today is what we mean when we talk about NBS in relation to addressing the shared social challenge of climate change specifically. So in 2017, uh, TNC scientists led the development of a paper that identified a number of different ways in which um, we can use nature to mitigate climate change or to avoid or remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And the study found um, that, that nature has the ability to mitigate approximately 11 gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions annually, or about one third of what's needed to stabilize the climate by 2030. This includes employing three basic approaches or types of practices, that is protection, improved management and restoration across four different types of ecosystems. And so you can see here forests, grasslands, wetlands, including coastal wetlands and, and croplands or farmlands as well. Next slide, please. Um, but just to pick up on the point that you just raised as well, Yuki, I think when we talk about NDS, it's critical to, to note that we're talking about the powerful role of nature in mitigating climate change, not as a substitute or an alternative to decarbonization, but in addition to actions in the energy and transport and industrial sectors to decarbonize deeply and rapidly as well. The fact is just that it's not gonna be enough to get off coal alone. We also need to be protecting intact natural systems. It's not gonna be enough to transition to electric vehicles. We also need to be sustainably managing our working lands and it's not gonna be enough to shift to lower um, emission production processes. We also need to be restoring forests and wetlands across the globe. Next slide, please. So how does TNC work on NBS in Asia Pacific? Um, we're focused, what we're focused on at the regional level is summarized here in this mission statement, that is harnessing government and private sector net zero ambitions to deliver nature-based solutions with meaningful people, nature, and climate positive outcomes at scale across Asia Pacific. Since that study in 2017 that I mentioned, the critical role of nature in climate change mitigation has only been reinforced and reemphasized. Any scenario that we look at, like I said, for meeting 1.5 or two degree targets involves nature and countries as well cannot meet their climate targets without actions in the land sector. In other words, nature-based solutions. And that's very true in this region as well as elsewhere. Um, so we see that the level of attention and ambition uh, to achieve net zero targets, so this has really created um, an opportunity to use NBS, uh, not only to achieve meaningful climate mitigation outcomes, but to uh, achieve critical outcomes for people and for biodiversity as well. And we're most interested in finding those pathways to do this at a large scale, noting that as a global community, we're moving way too slowly in our efforts uh, to address both climate and biodiversity crisis. Uh, next slide, please. So I think um, the key challenge or question for TNC, as probably is the case for many of us, is how we translate all of this potential into action and how we do that at the scale and the pace that's required. Uh, next slide, please. I've, I've got here a quick snapshot of the roles that TNC is playing. And so you can see in the green box on, on, on the left, on my left, um, we're undertaking applied science to understand the impact of nature-based solutions. We're demonstrating nature-based solutions best practice and building the capacity of others to do so as well. We're developing policy advice, drawing on our science and what we're learning from field implementation. And we're also identifying and co-designing mechanisms to direct more public and private funding uh, into nature-based, into high-quality nature-based solutions. You can see in the middle um, the key scaling mechanisms that we're focused on, which also reflects a lot of the partners that we work with, and then the outcomes that we aim to achieve 
So we place equal priority in all three of these outcomes that you see. Um, next slide, please. Under the demonstration and capacity development role that TNC plays, I just wanted to close off by highlighting a couple of examples of what we mean when we talk about high quality nature-based solutions projects that we're supporting, particularly in the Asia Pacific region. So I have here a couple of just two examples of, of projects that are generating credits today, um, but we're also undertaking a number of feasibility assessments for other projects, including blue carbon projects in coastal ecosystems and soil carbon projects in grassland ecosystems as well. But I think this is a this is a really interesting example where TNC played a few key roles uh, early on, very importantly, working in partnership um, with the Australian government uh, and, and with indigenous organizations in, in Northern Australia as well. Um, the, the main things that we did was one, we, we worked together to combine traditional fire management knowledge and methods with the latest fire science and to develop a, a carbon accounting methodology to be used in Australia's domestic market, which um, was, was, was um, used for having earlier, smaller controlled fires earlier in the season to prevent much larger outbreaks of large scale fires later in the season. And this has shown to dramatically reduce emissions. So we developed the method. The second role that we played in partnership, the second role that we played was to use philanthropy to then actually do a demonstration of applying the method. So that's often really important for these newer methods and newer approaches to NBS is to actually do a demonstration um, to, to, prove, to prove out the method and the approach. And then the other thing that we've done is we've supported ongoing capacity development, um, including establishing a indigenous carbon industry network or supporting the establishment of that network to act as a hub for knowledge exchange and capacity development and advocacy on behalf of Indigenous project managers. And so you can see the, the, the results that now, the band of running projects that are led by others, so, so not, not led by TNC, that are developed by others, but are using the method that we helped develop, you know, are now achieving pretty su substantial results, not only climate mitigation results, but also important socioeconomic and, and cultural resilience outcomes for Indigenous communities in Australia as well. And that's really important for this project because the critical key to achieving this large scale here has been co-designing a solution that responds to a top priority for many indigenous groups across Australia, which is to have economic opportunities to work on their land. Um, and then the last set of examples that I just wanted to, to point to as well come from China on the next slide, please. Um, and in China, TNC has been working since 2005 with governments and local communities and foundations playing a technical assistance role in everything from project design to implementation and monitoring. Um, and we've done this for six projects that are currently registered, um, covering 130,000 hectares uh, that are projected to remove 30 million um, tons of CO2 emissions. I think, you know, just again, talking about the multiple benefits and outcomes that can be achieved through these projects, these projects, they, they use science-based planning and management to, to reintroduce native species that have the ability to restore multiple benefits into these areas. And one of the ways that we're able to do that is we target biodiversity hotspots and ecologically vulnerable areas as well. And so you can see the before and after example of one of these projects in Inner Mongolia, where we had a project area that was located in between two nature reserves. And it was very arid um, and it was very vulnerable to des desertification and soil erosion and sandstorms. And so replanting of trees and shrubs into that area had a whole bunch of outcomes. It had, it had strong nature outcomes because it provided buffer zones and corridors to connect these nature reserve areas. It created a lot of employment opportunities for local communities um, within the project area. And then that also led to less pressure on the nature reserves, less poaching and illegal grazing and medicinal plant collection, for example. Um, and it also has helped to, to reduce vulnerabilities to, um, to extreme weather events. And so re reducing desertification, regulating water flow and improving soil quality as well. So these just offer some of the, some of the examples of the, the types of outcomes that we can get from nature-based solutions um, while addressing climate change mitigation. And I just hope this gives us a, a sense of what, what nature-based solutions have to offer and why they're so important as a start. Thank you, Alison. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Um, I think you know one of the more one of the important uh, point was you know policy and private partner private public partnership is very important to promote this these things in scale. So I would like to ask details of these things to the following uh, panelists, Ken and Aoyama-san. Uh, so firstly, I would like to invite Ken. 
Hi, Ken. Hi. So Amazon is also very active in nature-based solutions. So we would like to ask what you are doing. And also, you, you, I think you have a global project. So we would like to ask your global perspectives uh, in the space of nature-based solutions. Thank you. Sure thing. Thank you, Yuki Sung, for the introduction. And thank you to USJC for the opportunity to speak. Um, I was a speaker at a previous event on renewable energy and what we're doing to promote uh, the scaling up of renewable energy options. Um, that was uh, an opportunity for me to introduce the climate pledge that Amazon has made. So in 2019, we co-founded the climate pledge, which is a commitment to get to the Paris Agreement targets of net zero carbon, but 10 years earlier uh, than the Paris Agreement itself. So this is uh, by 2040, we pledged to reach net zero carbon across all of our operations. And we've been joined by over 400 other companies in making the same pledge since then. Um, last time when I spoke, it was around what we're doing to directly decarbonize our operations, particularly our energy use through energy efficiency and renewable energy purchases. Uh, this time, I'm going to talk more about our nature-based solutions. Um, we see these uh, two as going hand in hand. Um, and, and to Allison's point earlier, you know, first and foremost, we need to be focused on innovating and investing and eliminating emissions across the value chain of our business. That's what we're focused on primarily at the moment with our renewables purchases and others. At the same time, we also believe in driving meaningful and necessary actions outside of our value chain. And for this, we're looking primarily at nature-based solutions. Um, I'll get into more details as to how we think about nature-based solutions and when we try to qualify different kinds of projects, what we're looking into. But generally, as we've stated in the Climate Pledge itself, these solutions have to be additional. They need to be quantifiable. They need to be real, permanent, and socially beneficial. And I'll talk more about what each of those means in, in a little bit. But to give a sense of the kinds of nature-based solutions that we're already um, starting to get involved with, uh, these include efforts like conservation, restoration, improved land management um, on uh, 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 areas like forests, wetlands, peatlands, grasslands, farmland, and marine environments. Uh, there's two main kinds of projects that we're focused on. One is uh, supporting avoided emissions through preventing deforestation. And the second is looking at carbon sequestration through the kinds of afforestation and reforestation projects that Allison talked about at the end. So this is, um, first is avoided emissions from deforestation prevention. Second is scaling up nature-based carbon removal. And um, I'll go into more detail on this of what we're doing with each of these, but the I think for preventing deforestation, I, the reason why this is so important today is that we already know uh, that in order to stave off the most catastrophic effects of climate change, we can't get there with the current rates of deforestation that are proceeding today. Uh, so to speak to Allison's point about urgency, we need to be acting on this now. Um, and that's why we've made investments in this area. Uh, one of the examples of that is the LEAF coalition. Um, so we've helped to start the lowering emissions by accelerating forest finance coalition. This is a public private partnership with uh, the United States, United Kingdom and Norway, as well as a growing number of climate leading corporations like Amazon. Um, we do believe that the LEAF Coalition has the potential to be truly transformational um, in the effort to conserve world uh, tropical forests. And so that's one example. Um, actually, in terms of the afforestation, reforestation effort, uh, we have some projects underway with the Nature Conservancy. And so one example of that is the agroforestry and restoration accelerator that we set up in Brazil. Um, so this is an effort to create more sustainable sources of income for thousands of local farmers uh, in the Brazilian state of Pará. And uh, this is a two-part effort. One is restoring native rainforests uh, and fighting climate change by trapping and storing carbon there. At the same time, helping small farmers to uh, realize more sustainable livelihoods. And so this would involve things like uh, restoring degraded cattle pastures to native forests and agroforestry also sources of income through the sale of cocoa and other crops that can be uh, developed through this agroforestry effort. So 
This is, I think, uh, an important point for nature-based solutions is that the carbon removal part of it really is a means to an end. For local communities, what really matters to them are things like the sustainable livelihoods opportunities, uh, the biodiversity benefits, and all of the other uh, benefits that come from nature-based solutions. Um, just a couple more examples, and we can get into more details in the discussion itself. But another example of a project that we've worked on with the Nature Conservancy, uh, we have as Amazon Web Services, the cloud computing part of Amazon, a water positive goal by 2030. So we are uh, going to be returning more water to the communities in which we work than we consume by 2030. And we're even using nature-based solutions for some of these efforts. And so a good example of that was the project that we've worked on uh, with Nature Conservancy in South Africa, which was to uh, naturally restore, filter, and transport rainfall to rivers and dams in the greater Cape Town region. Um, they had a real issue with invasive plants. Uh, so think about things like acacia, pine, and eucalyptus trees that suck up a lot of water before it actually has a chance to reach the water table. And so to address this, Amazon worked with TNC and other partners for more than two years to lay the groundwork for a Greater Cape Town Water Fund, which is uh, funding the invasive species removal and replanting of native species that help more water to reach the water table. So those are just a couple of examples um, of Nature Conservancy work. I'll just finish with one last example that we announced this week. Uh, so in addition to the LEAF Coalition that I talked about earlier, uh, Amazon has also created the Right Now Climate Fund, which is a $100 million fund to restore and conserve forests wetlands and grasslands around the world. We just announced that this week, we're investing 15 million US dollars into nature-based projects in the Asia Pacific region, beginning with a $3 million commitment for initial projects in India. And so the first of these announcements in India was for a project in the Western Ghats, uh, which is funding a center of wildlife studies projects to replant trees and create carbon sinks and enhance wildlife conservation and livelihoods in the region. So that's a quick introduction. Um, I'm happy to talk more about details of our methodology and more projects in the Asia Pacific region in the discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. It's really wide range of very innovative um, approaches, which is very inspiring. So now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Aoyama to share with us a public sector perspective I think, you know, to promote private sector investment, I think government policy and regulations are very important. So I would like to ask Mr. Aoyama what kind of initiatives Japanese government is taking and perspectives on nature-based solutions. Thank you. あの、日本の生活環境を、ま、あの、悪影響を及ぼす。こういったことが、あの、起こっていました。え、自然豊か
あの海洋植物が生息しやすいような環境を、まあ、作ると。でこれはあの、えー、光が海の中に届くということが大事です。でそのため、えー、海の底に、えー、土砂を入れて、えー、浅いところを見ていったこと、こういう取り組みをやっています。これはあの海の森を作るときに非常に大事です。これはあの光合成をするためには、えー、光が届かなければいけないということがあるからです。えー、っと、next page, please. 私ども国土交通省では、この、えー、ブルーインフラ拡大プロジェクトという、えー、プロジェクトを進めています。これは、この写真にあるような、えー、アマとか、昆布といった海洋植物だけではなくて、その基盤となるような構造物とか、えー、先ほど申し上げた浅瀬を作るということ、こういったものを含めて、ブルーインフラっていう概念で呼んでいます。このブルーインフラっていうものを、えー、積極的に拡大していこうと。こういった取り組みを、えー、行っています。私どもが、国が一番役割としてになっているのは、この環境整備をするといったところが、国の役割であると。このように考えています。次のページお願いします。Next p a g e please.Next slide. で、えっと、私どもが、あの、やっている取り組みの一つの例として、ブルーインフラの整備の事例をご紹介します。えっと、あ、これ一つ前のスライドに戻っていただいてもいいですかね、ここは。Can you go back to the previous slide?Yeah, this one? これでいいですかはい、すみません。はい。私たちは、あの、えー、港を作る仕事をしています。この写真のように、あの、絵のように、港を作るときに大きな船が入るためには、えー、海底を掘ります。ここで発生した土砂をですね、リサイクルするような形で、えー、ここにあるような、えー、先ほど言った公害を、まあ、あの防止する対策とか、あとは干潟を作るといったこと、こういったことをやっています。特に最近ではこの干潟を作ったり、先ほど言った浅瀬、もモバルの、えー、生息する環境を整えるといったこと、こういったことを進めています。まあ、つまり、あの、藻場や日型を作るというよりも、その環境を整理する、これが国の役割だというふうに考えていて、国土交通省ではそういった取り組みを進めております。で、また、ネクストページ。最後のページになりますけれども、私とも、国の役割は先ほど申し上げた通りです。えー、インカセクターにはどういったことを期待しているかというと、具体的に、えー、モバイヤ日型を作っていただく、えー、こういうことをお願いしています、えー。環境団体とか、あとは民間企業の皆さんに、えー、一体となってやっていただく。ただ、えー、その一体となってやっていただくにそれぞれ役割があります。やはりその環境団体というのはモバイヤ日型を作るノウハウをたくさん持っています。えー、一方で、あの、民間企業の皆さんは、まあ、あの、資金的な、えー、ものを持っています。えー、こういったそ,のそれぞれの特徴を生かして、えー、皆さんでジョイントしてやっていただくといったことを、まあ、我々あのお願いしています。その時の一つの仕掛けとして、今、あのパワーポイントにありますように、カーボンクレジットを使って、その、えー、いろんな人を組み合わせるといったことを、あの、仕掛け作りを行っています。で、国土交通省の方で認可した、あの、ジャパンブルーエコノミー実践中組合という法人があります。この法人は、あの、いわゆる海洋植物、ブルーカーボン生態系から生み出される二酸化炭素の吸収量を、えー、第三者機関として認証する、そういった機関です。で認証するときに、えー、カーボンクレジットを発行します。でこの、えーまあ、認証するという行為で、モバを作った人がどれだけ CO2 の吸収量を生み出したかということを、まあ、あの認証します
。これによって、社会的に広く認知してもらうことができるようになります。また、あの、クレジット化することで、第三者に対して販売することができるようになります。このため、CO2 の吸収源を必要とするような企業にとっては、そういったモバを作った人から、権利としてカーボンクレジットを買うということで、カーボンニュートラルを進めることができるような、そういう仕組みになっていますで。そこで得られた収益は、モバを作った人に還元されます。そこで収益を得ることで、また次のモバ作りは、持続可能なモバを作るための資金の原資となります。こういった仕組みを作ることで、持続可能にモバづくりをしたいとなって、役割分担しながらやっていく取り組みです。これからも、環境団体や民間企業、あとは自治体などと連携して、日本の意味に盛りをたくさん作っていきたいと考えています。説明は以上です。ありがとうございました。Thank you, Aoyama san. Thank you very much.、Um, you know, it's a very innovative system to introduce blue carbon credit、uh, market. So I would like to come back to you later、uh, to ask more details. But now I would like to invite all the panelists and I would like to have some discussions. So, firstly, you know, this. Here, listening to your conversations or presentations, I more and more think that the public private sector partnership is really important. So, I would like to ask your opinions. Maybe, firstly, Alison, you know, you have a kind of broader cooperation with different sectors, but how do you see the importance or what is the expectation of yours? For the private sector to accelerate the nature based solutions? Sure. I mean, I, I could say a little bit about that. I mean, I think, I think to start with, if we're talking about the business sector, we're going to be touching on carbon markets. And, and we already have had a few points in this conversation. So at the outset, I think it's always just really important to be clear that you know, carbon markets are just one part of the overall response to climate change that's needed. They have potential to be very high impact and, and to scale up to be in a really critical mechanism to scale up nature based solutions, but it can really only happen if markets and offsetting are deployed in ways that transparently and measurably you know, accelerate global decarbonization and reduce the risk of greenwashing. So, just to be clear, that's really critical. And as a starting point, all companies should be setting you know, publicly announced net zero targets using the mitigation hierarchy. Prioritizing decarbonization of their own value chain and demonstrating and publicly dis disclosing their progress towards those targets. So, I think if we, if we start from there, from that kind of basic、um, understanding and expectation, there are a few important roles that I think businesses can play to accelerate MBS.、Um, I can speak to this at a high level. Some of them Ken's even already given some examples of with the work that Amazon's doing, and I'm sure he can probably provide you know, some, more, some more detailed examples from, from an actual business.、Um, but so, the first one is, is obviously. You know, the purchase of carbon offsets. So, you touched on that, Yuki. You know, companies can purchase verified carbon credits from high quality projects to compensate for their unabated emissions. So, so you know, that, that is an important mechanism. Like I said,、uh, of course, we've already highlighted it, it needs to be a complement to other actions, to decarbonization.、Um, businesses also need to be pursuing at the same time the technological innovation, the changes in management, and, and, and different investments to decarbonize their op operations. And these offsets should be a temporary, you know, limited solution, right? For, for, for difficult to achieve reductions that, that companies can implement now, today,、um, while kind of making those invest in, investments, you know, to, to, to fully to get to net zero longer term. And the airline sector is always a good example of this that you hear because, you know, it's not possible today to move to completely carbon free aviation fuels, for example, because of the cost of technological constraints.、Um, and so the purchase of carbon credits can allow. Airlines to take action now. And it does matter to act now, you know, rather than in 10 years from now, right? So it can allow those airlines to take action now while they're also kind of continuously doing the RD to get to the point where we can, we can move towards,、um, you know, carbon free, free fuel supply. So that's one thing. 
This other, a second role that I think businesses can play is what's increasingly being termed beyond value chain mitigation. And this is what, you know, Ken gave an example of this, right? That this is where companies take additional climate action above and beyond their net zero targets. Um, and they purchase, one of the ways they can do that is by purchasing credits from high quality nature-based solution projects that fall outside of their value chain. Um, you know, there are lots of opportunities outside of corporate supply chains. Um, and, and so companies can really play an important role and, and accelerating global progress towards net zero just across society, you know, beyond their own targets um, by making these kinds of investments outside of their own supply chain. And then the last one I'll say is, is you know, um, it's just catalytic funding through grants. You know, I think that maybe we don't like to talk about that as much because, because you know, we like to stop, think about sort of private capital and, 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 and expecting some kind of return, but where possible, Given where this market is, it's, it's really a new and, and developing market. Um, you know, there is a real need for companies to support the development of science, of capacity, early, early stage feasibility and, and market infrastructure to allow the expansion of, of high quality, credible NBS. Um, and I think an example is that, you know, a lot of the investments that we see mobilized through the carbon markets now, um, they, they come with a pretty a high expectation of a, an expectation of a pretty high level of a confidence on the return, um, which is usually in the form of carbon credits. And the reality is certainly the projects that I see, you know, in the region that have the potential to, live, to deliver all these outcomes we've been talking about are, are not quite at that point of having that level of confidence, right? So there's a real need to get in, you know, upfront, I think philanthropic or grant capital that allows local communities, local organizations, indigenous groups, you know, across the region to really understand you know, the potential, what can be achieved in their area to be able to do some of those assessments to then enter into conversations with project developers or investors from a place of real kind of knowledge and power and really play more of a role in, in, in engaging with and shaping the market. So I think that's a really important one too. Thank you. So the the the, the expectation for the private sector to play the role in, in this area is very high, but on the other not hand- small. I, <laughs> Not small. Not <laughs> small. But on yeah. the other hand, I can see that, you know, from private, I, I think there are many participants audience today from the private sector, and many of them probably think that, okay, it is very important, but as private sector, you know, how can we balance between the, 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 the financial returns and these important solving these important issues. Um, I think, you know, Amazon is really confidently putting quite a lot of resources in this area. And I would like to understand why you are doing this. What is the implication for your business, Ken? Sure thing. Um, thanks, yuki -san. And uh, thanks for the handoff, Alison. I think you're absolutely right uh, that it's important that we first do everything we can to decarbonize our operations. That's, again, what we're focused on first and foremost. Above and beyond those efforts, though, it is important that we invest in nature-based solutions now. and uh, to your question, yuki -san, is why are we doing this? Well, because it, it matters to our customers. I mean, it matters to the climate, of course, um, but it matters to our customers as well. And I'll, I'll give you a good example of this. It's not um, just the carbon value of our projects, but uh, for example, I'm, I'm talking to you today from Indonesia, where I'm here for the ASEAN ministers meetings that are happening, which is why there's some um, sirens outside. I apologize for the noise in the background. Uh, but Indonesia, for example, has the world's third largest uh, expanse of tropical rainforest. Uh, and they've made measurable progress in preventing deforestation in recent years. It's incredibly important that we support those efforts because uh, we can't afford to lose any more rainforest than we have today. Um, we can't reach the Paris Agreement targets without preserving what we have, in addition to increasing uh, forest coverage. So that's that's one example of a, a topic that's of great concern to, I think, people here in Indonesia, uh, businesses, to policymakers. It's one of the reasons why the LEAF Coalition has been working with uh, the Indonesian government and others in the region to try and address this and, and see how we can support further. Um, another good area that uh, I think Aoyama-san introduced is blue carbon projects. Uh, Indonesia is also home to the world's most uh, concentrated uh, mangroves forest. Um, and mangroves are incredible. They absorb up to 10 times the carbon that uh, terrestrial forests do. Uh, so they're, they're carbon heroes. 
uh, but they're also really important for coastal communities. About 80% of Indonesia's population lives within a coastal flooding zone. That's uh, we're going to see, you know, increasing sea levels from climate change. We're going to see greater uh, weather events coming from climate change. That's going to increase the surge, um, coastal flooding. Having mangroves in place to help uh, provide both that climate mitigation effort, but also that adaptation effort is incredibly important. Um, to the communities in which we work. And so that's another reason why uh, both through our in-communities programs uh, to date here in Indonesia, we've worked with uh, some of these mangroves restoration projects. It's also why we helped to found the Blue Carbon Institute. Um, so this is an effort that we worked on with uh, Conservation International with support from Singapore's Economic Development Board. Uh, but last year we worked to establish this Blue Carbon Institute and the idea is to develop the kinds of um, uh, measurement and accreditation and certification mechanisms that it's going to be really important for making sure that blue carbon projects are having the impact that they need to. Um, so blue carbon, sorry, I should have probably defined, that's uh, carbon stored in coastal and marine ecosystems. So think about things like mangroves. Um, I think Aoyama-san also had seagrasses and tidal marshes on his slides. Uh, these are ecosystems that can sequester and store large quantities of carbon in the plants and sediment below them. Um, but again, they're also really important for, um, you know, sustainable fisheries, uh, for preventing coastal flooding, and for a whole bunch of other things that really matter to, um, to, to the communities that live here. So biodiversity is another crisis that we're facing uh, in the midst of the climate crisis. And nature-based solutions have the advantage of addressing both at the same time, which is really why we're focused on this and why our customers uh, look to us to be doing more in this space. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. It's very important for the business sector to understand the relevance between our business and the wider nature. And it is important to understand what's the value for our customers and clients. Um, but at the same time, I think it's very important that the public sector's role is very important to make these initiatives more, be, more feasible or you know, feasible as business. And that's, that's the key for the private sector to put more investment and make it in scale. So, Mr. Aoyama, what what do you see the public sector's role in nature-based solutions, particularly to promote uh, private investment in this area? Well,予見性を高めてあげるということが大事だと思っています。一つの仕組みとしてブルーカーボンクレジット製造をご紹介しました。こういった形で、ただ単に自然再生するだけではなくて、そういった資源を再生する意図とすると、きっと企業としての経済性も
exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think this is a big question. I know we're short for time, so I'll I'll, I'll just sort of maybe zero in on on one thing. I mean, interestingly, we're talking about blue carbon now, and we actually just had a at a regional uh, workshop on blue carbon where we looked at at you know a lot of the some of the challenges that have meant that have just been mentioned even now in getting these projects you know up to a to the point where they can be scaled. Um, and I think from the policy side, one of the most critical areas that we are seeing policies starting to attempt to address, which is great, um, but I think where there still remain a number of challenges or, or maybe just data and capacity gaps is really defining and distributing the benefits from nature-based solutions activities. So there are a lot of um, components that go into that. Um, one is around land tenure and carbon rights. So I think particularly for nature-based solutions, um, it can be pretty challenging to clarify land ownership, which can often be a basis for carbon rights, for example. And even when you can do that, there, there, are, there may be communities that are using the land that are dependent on the land, but don't have formal ownership title. And so there are, I think there are real challenges around um, assigning you know, carbon rights equitably for these projects. Um, so that, that's one, one big issue. There is progress, um, but I think you know, if we can't figure that out, there are real important risks and challenges for equity, but also permanence of these projects. Um, that, you know, I think the issue of how to how to bring in these stakeholders from the very beginning to even define what the project objectives are, to define what those benefits should be, is also a really important issue that policymakers are starting to grapple with as they're regulating carbon trade within different countries across the region. So I think there's a lot that we're learning sort of from the project level. There are different, there's there's a lot of learning going on about different ways to to, to identify project objectives and benefits and then to to approach distribution and sharing of those benefits. So I think there's a lot that we can do now to sort of start capturing up that learning that's happening project by project and start figuring out what are the right kind of regulatory frameworks that can help assure kind of a consistent level of, of quality um, in that area across the board. And I would just highlight gender as a really important consideration as well, um, particularly again in the region where in, in Asia Pacific region where 80% of the people displaced by climate change are women and we have about 13% of landowners are women. And so there are these existing inequities that nature-based solutions can exacerbate if we don't find ways to address them. And I think policymakers need to be thinking about that. There are, and they are, um, but I, I think there's still a lot of work to do in those areas. So those are really important just because that, that equity is so critical, I think, to the success of these projects long-term. Thank you, Alison, because we have only five minutes left and I would like to pick up one question at least. So, Ken, um, do you have any additional comments to Alison? Uh, what kind of rules or regulations needed for, to promote private sector investment? Yeah, um, I, I'll, I'll try to be brief. I think, you know, the way Alison described it early on, um, the one of the challenges I think we face is how do we provide confidence that the carbon credits generated from these projects are standardized, quantified, and verifying measurement in a way that's reliable. Um, it's one of the things that we've been working on through the LEAF Coalition is to try and um, you know, come up with uh, conservative baselines and effective measurements to make sure that we're uh, accurately capturing the carbon uh, reduction value of uh, some of the prevention pre preventation of deforestation for example um also uh on reforestation projects i think we're we're still looking for ways to make sure that we're accurately capturing the carbon reduction value of those um so you know again measurement additionality making sure that we're avoiding leakage um, ensuring permanence in our projects is probably the really important thing when it comes to the carbon crediting part of this. Um, I also think Allison makes really great points about what else we need to be looking at as outcomes of these projects. It's not just that they are carbon uh, contributing to the decarbonization effort, but they also have to have those additional benefits for communities. And so we also yeah. are looking at things like equity, inclusion and rights in our projects. Um, we are looking at uh, targeting small landholders where we can, for example, um, and trying to make sure that the benefits are shared with local communities. Um, in addition to the ecological benefit, the financial benefit or the uh, livelihoods benefit uh, to these projects is incredibly important for making sure that the projects that we're funding are successful. Thank you. 
so to 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 also maintain or to to cap to gain confidence um i think you know the, the internationally recognized standard is very important i think japanese government is trying to make the blue carbon initiative to more international so can you briefly share with us your visions aoyama san no まずは、あの、日本国内で維持例をたくさん作っていこうと思います。維持例というのは、あの、いろんな国と連携してですね、ブルーカーボンのワークショップをやりたいなと思ってまして、あの、国際的にもぜひその日本のブルーカーボンのまああのこの一連のシステムを紹介しながらいろんな国の皆さんともあの一緒になってやってい
technology and the capacity of nature will bring us a lot of innovative solutions to 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 mitigate um, the cr the crisis we are facing now. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining today's discussion. And please give a big hand to the panelist, um, Barjali. Thank you very much. And I give it back to Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Isugai-san, for a wonderful job moderating today's discussion. I agree. I wish we'd had more time. I learned a lot. I actually didn't know very much about this topic. I've been trying to learn and getting ready, but it was really fantastic. But what I do see are a lot of themes that connect with our um, other discussions as part of this series. And that's definitely this challenge that uh, Ken articulated really well around measuring and all the challenges there. Um, and I really felt more than in other discussions, we got to really get into equity and social justice and why these externalities are, are important beyond the strictly business case. And every conversation we have just reminds us how lucky we are when we have public private partnership and how much more we need of it. So thank you. I wanna thank um, all of our sponsors for making our program possible, but especially today our um, CSI partner, Amazon. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to the staff uh, who helped make this program possible and make it smooth and our partners at Pictor as well. Uh, we look forward to uh, continuing these conversations around climate and sustainability at our annual conference in Washington, DC, November 8th and 9th. We have actually a range of topics in addition to climate and sustainability. So please register to join us. I guarantee you'll find some fascinating conversations in this climate and sustainability space, but also on a whole range of other topics. If you wanna learn more about the council or donate to support our activities, please um, learn more at the web address that's in the chat. This concludes today's webinar. For those of you who are participating in the follow-on roundtable discussion, which will begin at uh, 15 minutes after the hour, you can join by a separate link that was emailed to you when you registered. Otherwise, thank you all for being part of our community. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you so much. <laughs>